Hello and welcome to English 416 C, the literature of the early American Republic. I will be your instructor, Dr. Sam Lackey. I'm excited to get started. I hope you are too. This is the introductory lecture. So I will not be getting into any of our week one material, not yet. I will cover that in the week one lecture, which you can access by Tuesday of week one. But for now, I just want to provide a brief overview of the class, let you know what to expect. And I want to talk a little bit about books, web campus, um, our schedule, and just a few other important pieces of information. So again, welcome. I'm excited to get started. I'm glad that you all uh, decided to join me on what promises to be a strange and interesting uh, adventure, a journey back to the origins of American literature, the beginning of American literature. So uh, hopefully you guys already have at least a general idea of what we're doing in this class. Uh, the name of the class hopefully gives you some information. The era of the early republic is a uh, historical period. It's been defined and largely used by historians, but we're going to use it in here as a way to really narrow our focus and zero in on the first several decades of American literature. So this era of the early republic is usually thought to begin in 1789 with the ratification of the U.S. Constitution. So at that point, we are sort of officially an independent nation, sort of operating with our own government, and uh, that's the beginning of this period, and it generally extends all the way up to around 1830. Uh, some historians define the era a little bit differently. Sometimes you might see people extending uh, the sort of uh, terminus all the way up to maybe 1840 or thereabouts. But for our purposes, we're going to think of this period as lasting from the 1780s, basically, all the way to 1830 or thereabouts. So uh, the limits here, the parameters are not hard and fast, but that's the general era, the general historical period that we're talking about. So really, we're only covering about 40 to 50 years in terms of historical time. But a lot happens during those four or five decades. A lot of really important developments in early American literature that, frankly, don't get a lot of coverage in typical English classes, in typical lit classes. I mean, you guys should know you've taken some literature classes before, hopefully, or at the very least, you've taken, uh, well, yeah, I would imagine by now we've all taken some lit. And I know some of you took my American Literature 451 class whenever that was. I think that was several semesters ago. So some of you are already familiar with some of these early American texts and some of these important early American authors because I covered some of this stuff in 451. But of course, we're getting into a lot more depth, a lot more detail now. But this is a period of American literary history that is often shrouded in darkness. <laughs> uh, and, and we're going to explore some of the reasons why. Typically, when we think about the development or the birth of a unique, uh, sort of distinctive national literature, an American literature that is recognizable uh, and distinguishable from other national literatures, different from English literature, you know, coming from England, different from other literatures found in Europe and other parts of the world, older traditions, older nations. Uh, a lot of times when we're looking for that sort of moment, when we're looking at the beginning or the dawning of American lit, we often go back to the old days, but we might stop in the 19th century. We often find the beginning sometime around the middle of the 19th century, and we think about some authors that you guys have heard of and probably read before. Again, if you took my 450 class, and I think 451, and I think about half of you did, uh, 
you remember the American Renaissance. And even if you didn't take my class, you've heard of these guys. You've read a lot of their works. We're talking about Walt Whitman. We're talking about Emerson, Melville, Poe. Hawthorne, maybe, uh, maybe, you know, Emily Dickinson. A lot of times that group that really came, uh, kind of rose to prominence beginning in the 1840s, 1850s, Dickinson came a little later. Uh, we often look at that group as the first recognizable, distinguishable, unique group of American authors who helped create what we now think of as American literature. Now, there's some truth to that. Those authors are important. I love those authors. I teach those authors. But we're making a bit of a mistake if we think that there was nothing before them. <laughs> uh, they didn't start American literature. They brought it to new heights. They provided new innovations. They, you know, enhanced the readership of American literature for a lot of different reasons in a lot of different ways. But what we're going to see in this class is that a, a lot of those authors were utilizing uh, tropes, genres, styles, themes, and settings that were already in use, had already been established by earlier, less well-known American authors. And because a lot of time has passed now, as modern students, as modern readers, we tend to forget the early sort of originators. And we remember the perhaps more skilled later practitioners. <laughs> and I'm not going to deny that some of those American Renaissance figures might be artistically superior to a lot of the authors that we will be reading. Now, you might disagree with that, but uh, the authors that we're reading help to get everything started. And they do that in a lot of interesting ways. And those more famous authors that come along later are really indebted in many ways to the authors that we're going to be exploring. And the good news is the stuff that we're reading is artistically enjoyable as well. <laughs> but sometimes you might have to search a little bit for that enjoyment. You'll have to get accustomed to some old language, some archaic styles. But of course, I'm here to help. Uh, my lectures should help with that. And I think you guys are going to like some of what we read. Everybody likes different texts. Everybody likes different material. But somewhere along the line, you should find something that appeals to you because we are reading a really diverse, varied, uh, uh, just a really heterogeneous group of texts from a lot of different types of authors, a lot of different subject matters. So no matter what your tastes might be, you should find something to intrigue you over the course of this semester. So hopefully I'm selling it pretty well, but at this point you're in here. <laughs> so even if it doesn't sound great, uh, we're on this ride together. I will try to make it fun, but I think you guys will have some fun, like I said, even without me. So we're going to try to create a community here. Uh, so one of the things I want to mention, well, I'll get to that in a moment. Let's talk a little bit about Web Campus and our weekly modules. So I want you guys to get into the routine of doing certain things at the beginning of each week. This is obviously an online class, as all lit classes or all upper level lit classes are here at GBC. So I'm hoping we've all had experience, obviously, in other online lit classes so we have a general idea of how these work. So there's a handful of things that I want you guys to look for at the beginning of each week. And for me, a week begins on Monday morning. That's when I publish that week's module in Web Campus. That's when everything for the week should be available to you. Now here in week one, it's a little different because I'm doing two videos as opposed to just one. But typically, typically, everything that you need for the week will be available Monday morning, first thing, even if you're an early riser. Uh, and then the week ends on the ensuing Sunday evening by midnight. So almost all of my assignments will be due on Sunday nights at the end of weeks. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, so at the beginning of each week, 
when you open up that week's module and you're sort of ready to get started, here are the things that you should do. Number one, check out the weekly overview. The week one overview is already available. There's lots of good stuff in there. First of all, I provide basically lecture notes. I'll give you kind of a summary in written form of everything that we'll be covering that week all the authors, and usually I'll at least mention a lot of the texts. Now, sometimes I'll really just kind of provide historical background or context or uh, maybe some author's uh, biographical information. A lot of that is stuff that I don't really want to talk about in lecture. Uh, in lecture, I want to focus on whatever we are reading that week. So I want to really focus on textual analysis, and I want to point out some things that you guys might be able to spend time analyzing later. So in the overview, I just stick to more of the general info, a lot of context, a lot of history, frankly, because... I want you guys to sort of think of what we're doing as literary history. We are going back and sort of rediscovering uh, old texts from a much earlier period in our national history. So we are doing a lot of historical work. So I'll give you a lot of that info in the overview. Also in the overview, you'll find that week's reading assignment. Uh, you'll find any other assignments that might be due by the end of the week. I will have links. I will have all the info that you need. Uh, so just spend a few minutes at the beginning of each week reading through all of that. Just click on the overview and everything's inside. Also, watch my weekly lecture video. Uh, this week, as I said, the week one lecture will not be available until Tuesday. But normally, the weekly lecture will be available first thing Monday morning, along with everything else. Uh, I know a lot of us signed up for an online class, at least in part, so we would not have to listen to lectures. <laughs> and obviously, I cannot make you guys watch these videos, but I strongly recommend that you tune in. We're covering a lot of ground. Uh, I am presenting a lot of information in this class, so the lectures really are helpful, and I will try to keep them brief. I will try to keep them somewhat entertaining, but between uh, the lecture video, the information found in the overview, and of course your own reading as you move through our texts, you should have everything that you need to be able to understand and then later analyze, interpret, explain, etc. All right. Uh, the other thing that you'll typically need to do each week is provide your discussion post. So this is a very important part of the class. Uh, I maintain a discussion board throughout the semester and most weeks, not every single week, but the vast majority of weeks, I will expect you guys to uh, post your own uh, contribution to the discussion board by the end of the week. So you always have until the end of the week to do that. But you guys have participated with, in discussions before on, you know, in, in online classes, I assume. Uh, and if not, don't worry. They're pretty straightforward. I will usually provide some kind of a prompt. I will ask some questions, <laughs> uh, just some things that are designed to kind of get the ball rolling, get some ideas flowing, and to help you get started. So, for example, the week one discussion is already available, and I'm just asking some general questions about the texts that we're reading this week. So, feel free to respond to my questions, but also feel free to do your own thing. Uh, my questions are simply there if you need some help getting started. But if you have your own ideas, if you have your own sort of uh, areas that you want to explore, by all means, do that. You do not have to uh, respond to me. What's more important is that you respond to each other. And that's a real bit, that, that's a, you know, a very prominent part of the discussion board. I want you guys to talk to one another. I would like you guys to occasionally respond to one another uh, with your posts. And that's actually a requirement, not every week, but by the end of the semester, I'm going to expect uh, 
for all of you to have responded to one another, uh, you know, at least a handful of times over the course of the semester. I don't really like to put a number on it because that feels arbitrary. I just want you guys to do it periodically or you know, some people like to respond to a classmate every week or every other week or whatever. You can have your own system or you can just make sure that you're doing it a few times over the course of the semester. But, you know, you guys should be, you know, in addition to learning from me, you can also learn from each other. And sometimes reading your classmates' posts can be really helpful. It can provide you with new perspectives. They might point out things that you totally missed <laughs> or you know, totally overlooked or just didn't think about. So really, it, I really do encourage you guys to not only keep up with your own posts, but also read what your classmates have to say. Now, this is a small class. <laughs> uh, I believe there, uh, I think there's only six of you. Uh, so... We can have some really good sort of sort of you know intimate conversations. I don't mean about intimate details of our lives. I just mean it can feel like we are a sort of uh, small group. Uh, we can get to know each other, and we can have good uh, information exchanges. <laughs> we can exchange ideas. We can debate. And we can also learn from one another. So every once in a while, I might jump on the board and respond to what somebody else says or pose a new question. But for the most part, I like to stay out of the way after I create that week's uh, post. And I just want you guys to really run that thing. All right, so that's something that we need to get accustomed to. Again, that's a weekly part of the class. The only exceptions will be a couple of the weeks where we have really major assignments due. Um, and on those weeks, I will not require a post. But otherwise, just expect to do one every week. So that's pretty much it. Read the overview, watch my lectures, uh, make sure you're keeping up with the reading, and make sure you're posting to our discussion board each week. If you can do those things, you should be in good shape. So let's talk a little bit about the course schedule. If you guys go to the syllabus, if you go over to that left-hand toolbar um, with all that stuff listed there, you know, assignments, announcements, modules, grades, all that stuff, you should see syllabus. Click on that. You can see all of the assignments that will be due over the course of the semester along with due dates. And you can also access the actual syllabus. You can also find it in the week one module. Go ahead and save that file or perhaps print it. Uh, at least keep it handy because there's a lot of good information in there. Of course, you guys have seen a course syllabus before. You know a lot of what's already there. But if you want to see all of the assignments, all of the point values, of course, that's all there. All of my policies, all of my contact info, email, my office location, <laughs> in case any of you are located near Winnemucca. I doubt it. Um, but the most important part of the syllabus is the course schedule that you can find near the end. It's like the last part of the syllabus. The course schedule uh, is, is a good thing to keep handy. It's a good thing to consult occasionally just to make sure that you're keeping up. And if you want to see when things are due, if you want to see how we are moving through the semester, all of that information is available. So let's talk about the books and let's talk about the reading assignments a little bit. So this is a literature class. This is a 400 level literature class, as we know. So I do have pretty high expectations when it comes to reading. We have to read a lot. Now, I understand. I try to be reasonable. Uh, I understand that you all have other things going on in your lives, other classes. Most of us have, you know, most of you <laughs> have jobs, families, whatever. So I'm not asking you to do anything that strikes me as unreasonable, but just understand that there will be some weeks where you're going to have to do a lot of reading. We're covering a lot of texts. Uh, we're only tackling a couple of really long books, but that's what I wanted to point out. Because of our time constraints and because I'm trying to squeeze in as many interesting texts as possible, we don't have time to devote any more than two weeks to any single text that we read. 
And just for your future reference, when I refer to texts, I'm just referring to whatever we're reading. That's an, uh, kind of a catch-all, all-encompassing term. So I'm talking about the poetry, the novels, everything that we're tackling over the course of the semester. It's mostly novels because I'm kind of a novel guy. That's my background. That's what I know the best. But I have worked in some poetry uh, as well. So, but, but the point I'm trying to make is that you need to plan your time. You need to budget your time. Because there will be some weeks where the reading load is actually kind of light. For example, beginning in week two, we start reading our first major text, The Coquette, by Hannah Webster Foster. This is a short novel. It's under 200 pages. It's a quick read. However, I also want you guys to read the introduction at the beginning by Kathy Davidson, a very well-known American literature scholar who's done a lot of great work uh, on Foster and this text in particular. The intro isn't very long, but it's maybe another 15 pages. So when you tack on the intro uh, along with the novel, you're looking at about 200 pages total. That's not too bad, and we're going to have two full weeks to get through that. So you might finish early. <laughs> That's fine. You might not need two full weeks for a short, relatively easy read. Great. But later on, for example, our second major text is Reuben and Rachel by Susanna Rousen. This is a much longer novel, as you can probably tell just by looking at it. So this book is nearly 400 pages. And in my personal opinion, it's a tougher read because Rousen is not as good as Foster. At least I don't think so. You guys are welcome to disagree. Uh, but we only have two weeks to get through Reuben and Rachel. So it's not a bad idea to get a little bit ahead. For example, if you finish the coquette early, you might want to go ahead and start the next book because it's longer. So again, that's why you should have the course schedule saved or printed. So you can always see what's coming up. And if you have the books, you know the long ones and you know the short ones. And you also know how fast you read. See, it's hard to schedule reading assignments in a class like this because everybody reads at different paces. Uh, I myself am not an especially fast reader. People assume that I am because my background is in literature. But no, I'm kind of slow and deliberate. So for me, if I knew that Reuben and Rachel was coming up soon, I might want to get a jump start on but it's really up to you. And uh, it's not the end of the world if you fall a little behind. So if we're moving on to the next text and you're still finishing up Reuben and Rachel, you know, that might, you, you should be able to catch up, but you don't want to make that a habit. And if you are falling, uh, falling behind big time in a major way and it's starting to cause real, you know, real concerns, you need to get in touch with me. And that's just a really important truism that we need to establish here at the beginning of the semester. Communication is key in an online class like this. So if you guys are struggling with anything, any assignments, if you're falling behind because of illness or family obligations or work problems, whatever, just let me know. And if you need an extension on any assignment, let me know. We can usually work something out, but you need to talk to me before the assignment is due, not after. I can't do much for you after the fact, but we can work out a plan beforehand if you email me or talk to me in some other way. So just remember that. All right, so again, take a look at the syllabus. You don't have to read it word for word, but check out the class schedule and just kind of glance over my policies, the assignments. But again, the assignments can be viewed just in here uh, in Web Campus. So take a look at deadlines and take a look at all the stuff that we're doing. So I try to keep it simple for the most part in terms of assignments. I don't like lots of different types of assignments <laughs> because that becomes confusing, I think, for y'all and me. So basically, we only have a few groups 
of different types of assignments that we'll be doing. Uh, I've already mentioned discussion posts. That's a weekly thing, as I said. We'll also have three critical response papers. So those are just short essays. Those are opportunities for you to respond to some of the texts that we're reading. And you can also try on some different critical approaches or some different interpretive strategies that we'll be discussing as well. Uh, so those are relatively low stakes, but they are worth 100 points a piece, and I expect them to be polished. Uh, but like I said, they are relatively short. And then we also have, of course, our major essay, our final essay that's due at the end of the semester. But before you do that, I want you to do a proposal and a brief critical summary. And that's another assignment that, you know, I'll talk about more <laughs> in the future, but that's an assignment that's really kind of focused on the research component of the final paper. And of course, part of it is just you proposing your idea for that final paper so I can sign off on it. Um, and that's it. <laughs> uh, that's it. The, the uh, three critical responses, the big paper at the end, the discussion posts, the sort of paper that gets us ready for the big paper, the summary and proposal, and of course, a midterm and a final exam. But as I mentioned in the syllabus, uh, if you guys don't want to do a midterm and you prefer a cumulative final, that's fine with me. I'm happy to cut the midterm and just make the final worth 200 instead of 100 points. No, no sweat for me. So a lot of students prefer that. Um, in my personal opinion, a cumulative exam is a little bit tougher uh, than the final would otherwise be if we had a midterm, but it's totally up to you guys. In my 451 class, we elected to cut the midterm. Uh, and that seemed to work out fine for most people. So uh, we'll take a vote later on. This is one of the rare examples where the class really will function as a democracy. <laughs> Normally, uh, it doesn't really go that way. But it's totally up to you guys because it doesn't make a difference to me. Um, I don't mind not having to grade the midterm. So think about it, and we'll talk about it more uh, once we get a few weeks into the semester. So again, take a look at all the different assignments when they're due. And if you have any questions, let me know. All right. Well, that's pretty much all that I wanted to cover. Just as I mentioned, we have a very diverse set of texts, which I think is really exciting. Um, you'll notice that we're looking at a lot of women authors. We're going to be reading a Native American author here in week one. We also have an African American author featured in week one. So uh, part of what's fun about this era is that American literature had not really been defined or codified yet. And I'll talk a lot more about this once we get into our actual material. But this was a period where literary boundaries were very loosely uh, defined. Things were kind of up in the air. There was a lot of innovation. And the literary scene was in many ways more open um, than it would later be. And I think that's true of American society in general, in certain ways. Now, again, it's complicated. And there were already a lot of oppression, a lot of restrictions, a lot of exclusions that were already in place. And we're going to start talking about some of those very soon with the coquette. We might even start talking about it with some of our week one texts. But when we talk about the early days of American settlement and the Rousen novel, Reuben and Rachel really covers this terrain, we're going to notice that at the very beginning of American settlement, at the very beginning of American colonialism, a lot of things were sort of up for grabs. Um, we hadn't established all of our norms all of our uh, sort of racist or misogynist values and structures and systems, a lot of those were already underway, but they would become much more rigid and much more difficult to escape a little bit later on. So during our period, a lot, like I said, a lot of these boundaries were being formed, but there was still this sense of opportunity, this sense of formlessness. I'll talk more about that in week one. Lack of form, lack of clear literary categories. There was a lack of an obvious, clear literary tradition. Just like we were creating a new nation, we were also creating a new literature. 
a new literary tradition. And yes, parts of it came from England, other parts of the British Isles, Europe, older traditions. But as we'll see, a lot of stuff was changing and happening right here. We were bringing a lot of innovations to the table ourselves, the early American authors that we'll be studying. So one interesting thing that we'll talk about a lot more in week two, once we get started on the coquette, is that these early days of American literature really coincide with the sort of popularization and the development of the modern English language novel. We didn't invent the English language novel, but we did a lot to advance it in many ways. So we're going to be exploring some of that. There's a lot of stuff going on during this historical period that we're going to explore, and we're going to see how the literature of this era reflects the larger society that we were building and developing at the same time. So hopefully that sounds pretty good. And I also hope that you guys have the books. But part of the reason we're waiting until week two to get started on the coquette is I was assuming that maybe not all of us do have the books just yet. So if you don't, that's okay. Here in week one, everything that you need to read is available in the week one overview in the form of either PDF files or simply links that take you to web pages. It's all free, it's all available, and it's all there for you right now. But beginning next week, in week two, I want us to get started on The Coquette. So at the very least, you need to buy this book. And it's important that you buy the edition that I ordered. So on the syllabus, page one, I list all of the uh, required material, and I include the ISBN numbers. Uh, because I really do want you guys to have the editions that I have, because oftentimes these are critical editions, edited, put together by scholars, literary historians, experts. And a lot of times we have really good critical intros, like Davidson's, that will really help provide context and get us ready for the major text. So... And also for pagination, when I'm talking in lecture, it just really helps uh, if you guys have the same editions. So if you go to the bookstore website, uh, you can see all the editions that I ordered through the Elko Bookstore. I know we don't always want to go through the Elko Bookstore, and you don't have to. I don't care how you get these books, just as long as you get them and you get the right editions. So I believe I had seven books listed. I, I ordered seven books from the bookstore, and I called six of them required and one of them recommended. And I actually made a mistake. Uh, I, I put the coquette down as recommended, but I meant to make it required, and the text that was supposed to be recommended was Modern Chivalry by Brackenridge, because we are not going to read this whole thing. So don't worry. If you've already gotten this book and you're looking at it and thinking, dear God, we have to read this whole thing. No, we don't. We are only reading excerpts. So I meant to make this optional, and I wanted to say that the coquette was required. But I made a silly error, and I got them mixed up. Uh, but don't worry, if you didn't buy the Coquette, or if you just refuse to buy it because it's only listed as recommended, <laughs> uh, it is available online. It is available online, and I made it available in the past to previous classes, so I can just link you to the website, and you can read it online if that's the way you want to go. That's also an option for modern chivalry. That's why I wanted to make it recommended because we're only going to read the first couple of volumes and you can access that online. But it's a beautiful book. I mean, it's, it's nice to have anyway. And you can read the rest of it later because I'm sure you'll enjoy it. It is pretty fun. It's, 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 it's comic. Uh, it's lighthearted. Um, all right. So that's enough. I'm just rambling at this point. But make sure to get all of the books, okay? Uh, the Coquette, okay, it's optional, I guess. But get the others. Well, I'm already telling you that Modern Chivalry is also optional, more or less. So get the other five. <laughs> the Prairie by James Fenimore Cooper, 
Ruben and Rachel, I've already shown you that one. A title that I'm still learning how to pronounce. Uh, this is a weird one that we're going to have a lot of fun with, I think. It's about uh, the Spanish conquest of Mexico. The subject matter is not fun, but it's just a really bizarre text, and very few people know much about it. And also, this is not the edition of Wheeland that I ordered. I wish. It's the stuff of nightmares, but th I think this is out of print, this old version that I have. So, <laughs> so I ordered a new edition, uh, but make sure you get Wheeland by Charles Brockton Brown as well. And also, Hope Leslie, I, I, I left it in the office. I don't have it here at home, uh, but get Hope Leslie by uh, Catherine Maria Sedgwick. That is also one of the books that we're reading. So again, Get ready to read. Get ready to stick with our weekly routine. If you have any questions about books or anything else, just let me know. And a final thing before I sign off, uh, the week one readings. Again, they're all relatively short. Uh, I've linked you to them. I've posted PDFs. Take a look at the overview. We're just sort of exploring some early American authors from the late 1700s. So again, we're playing a little bit fast and loose with our historical boundaries. So we're actually starting uh, in the 1770s and the 1780s with some important sort of revolutionary era poets. And also, I have an execution sermon by Samson Ockham, the first published Native American writer in American literary history. So check that out. Those of you who took my 451, you'll recognize some of these names and some of these texts. You'll recognize Wheatley and Freneau and Ockham because I think we did him in 451. But there's also new stuff that you did not have in 451, uh, like the Crevacor uh, and like the Joel Barlow poem. So I'm not going to get into any of that stuff right now. At the beginning of my week, one lecture, I will talk about the text that we read in week one, of course, and I'll also give you a little bit of a preview for the coquette to get you ready for our first major text. So let me know if you have any questions, problems, or concerns. I think we'll have a lot of fun this semester. I love this stuff. Even if you don't like all of it, hopefully some of my enthusiasm will bleed through the screen. And, uh, and help you out. Uh, so again, stay in touch with me. Let me know if you have any questions. And I'll see you in the week one lecture soon.